Well, if the kids haven't been dismissed, you are officially dismissed now, okay? Uh, so feel free to make your way and uh, enjoy and cherish your little ones, of course. Um, I know it's cliche to say it, but they do grow up very, very fast. And um, so just cherish the moments and don't get in such a hurry, you know, to get everything done in life and forget about um, these precious ones that you've been entrusted with. So it's really a blessing. It's great to have you here today. And um, I'm Pastor Joey, and it's a privilege to stand before you each week and share out of the, the Bible. We've recently been out of town. Um, we went to Kansas City, uh, Kansas, Missouri. It's kind of right on the state line there. And then um, we got to see Donette's mom and some of her extended family. And they all live there in Overland Park, or near Overland Park, which is where Megan lives. So we got to see Megan uh, just briefly for a couple of evenings. And then she was out of town going to a wedding. And so we went from there to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, 104 degrees. 104 95 in Indiana looked pretty good. It looked pretty good, but unfortunately, it was 104. I, I'm not sure, but what, you couldn't crack an egg on the pavement and fry it. I mean, it was just that hot. Um, you'll be glad to know that Will has not blown up the Army base yet, so <laughs> Fort Sill, Oklahoma is still a functioning base so far as we know. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, he's surviving, and... Um, Hopefully is adjusted enough to the heat. It's a very challenging program, though. He shares some things with us from time to time, and so it's very challenging. There's nothing a given, so he's having to work pretty hard. Um, but just continue to pray for him. Um, but it was good. It was good to be in cowboy country for a little while. And uh, but we're back, and it's great to be back here in in uh, Northeast Indiana. Uh, and also, uh, I want to thank you. Um, I. I have probably not been surprised very much in my life in terms of just things catching me totally off guard where I can usually sense things and maybe sniff it out and know something's coming. But I was totally, honestly, sincerely surprised um, to receive an award here in our community as a Citizen of the Year Award and uh, I feel like I need to rededicate that back to you, the congregation, and, and to Harlan Height, who loves to work behind the scenes to do so many good things for all of us. I was totally fooled. I sincerely was. I, he, Harlan had told me, he said, you know, Paul Fott's going to be getting an award. And uh, he, he would like, we would like you to come and give the invocation at the at the uh, the ceremony, the, the Chamber of Commerce ceremony. And so, well, sure, Harlan, I'd be glad to do that. And so we set the date, and I show up, and um, and they, I give the invocation, and Tim Skimmerhorn got tickled at me because I was praying for the person who was going to receive this award. God help this person who's going to receive this award. Bless them in our community. I had no idea I was praying for me. Uh, but... <laughs> It was so funny, though. I, and, you know, Midway, I, I thought it was funny when, like, church people were there. I couldn't figure, like, well, I knew they loved Paul, but I, I didn't know they loved him that much. And, uh, <laughs> and so I'm just like, well, this is going to be great. I'm excited for Paul. And, um, and uh, Chris and the family, this is going to be awesome. Um, and then so I'm show, I, I show up and... Um, Harlan has kind of a strange look on his face. I'm like, something is, I, I thought something's wrong with Harlan. I thought something was wrong with Harlan. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. Um, but he said, hey, he, said, he came over and he said, listen, he said, um, we, Paul and Chris, have a schedule conflict or something. They can't arrive soon enough to eat dinner. We've got meal tickets. I'm going to quickly call your wife and son, have them come and just eat the meal in place of Paul and Chris. Is that okay? I still had no idea. I, it's, Harlan, it's fine. I'm sure just have them come down. It'd be nice to have dinner with them. And I still, and they walk in, they sit down by me. I, I'm clueless. I'm like, no, nah, I don't know. If this is good. Good for them. And then, uh, so it didn't hit me then. And then I started getting a clue when uh, Harlan gets up and he says something about 
this person has been a pastor in our community for several years. And I thought, I did not know Paul Fott was a pastor (laughs) in our community for several years. I really didn't know. I'm like, man, I thought I knew the place pretty well, but he's been pastoring all this time and never told anybody. Seriously, that's what I was thinking. I had no idea. And, uh, And so he kept going and going. It's like, you know, this is sounding kind of like my life a little bit. I didn't know there was so many overla- so much overlap. And I'll be daggone if, um, if Harlan Height pulled it off. The king of manipulation and deception right here. He pulled it off. Probably one of the greatest surprises of my life. I, have, I had no idea. And you know, I don't want to put Harlan on the spot this morning. But I kind of think that that is my sermon for today. Is Harlan loves to do things in the background without you knowing. He likes to create create these little surprises for you. And then he likes to sit back and watch what happens when the moment of revelation becomes clear. What if we all, and again, Harl, I'm not putting you on the, uh, on the uh, hot seat or the spotlight this morning, but what if we all were Harlan Heights? What if each of us work behind the scenes, and many of you do, but to work behind the scenes to orchestrate these special moments of surprise in someone's heart, in someone's life, to honor someone in some way that they least expect it, And we lived our life wondering who could I orchestrate a special moment of love for today or this week or this month or this year. Love. That's love. And I wonder as I think about this installment of the story and transitioning to that this morning. How that, you know, Paul was a great church planner and... Uh, he traveled all over the Near East uh, via boat and Roman roads to tell the story. And we're in a series called The Story and we're kind of unfolding the narrative, the larger narrative of the Bible. And we're at the place where the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus has already happened and now the followers are left behind. Uh, Not so much that we're... uh, you know, we're complacent or, or we're lost without an agenda or we have no mission or vision. No, he left us with a vision and a mission. And, uh, and his vision was to establish these little communities all over the Near Eastern world. And really that would extend out all over the world. And these little communities would be little communities of love. Little communities where they would be energized by the resurrection of Christ... They would teach truth. They would build each other up in the faith and spiritual giftings would allow them to do that. They would reach their community with the story. And they would dedicate themselves to being ready for the return of Christ. That's Paul's mission in a nutshell. Pauline Theology 101. That's it. Looking at the sky, working the earth. Watch the sky, work the earth. And when you're working the earth, Love the people in on the earth. And establish these little communities of love. <clears throat> where people would work to see their communities changed. And see lives changed. There's an awful lot of hate in the world. There's an awful lot of divisiveness in the world. And yes, it is true that one of the greatest revolutionary acts is simply to tell the truth. And we're going to see that in our passage today. Just telling the truth is important. We need these little communities that tell the truth to us. And, but we need these communities that, that love us as well. And that balance those two things out in truth and love. Balance those things out. Because those who really love us, truth tell with us. And those who tell us the truth love us. Sincerely. And truly. But there's a lot of divisiveness in the world. A lot of hatred in the world. A lot of just this is feeling that you're on your own. And it's every man and woman for himself or herself. And, uh, 
And I think as a great corrective to this, and it's not new because it was, it was happening in one of these little believer enclaves that Paul helped establish and that he later, um, that he later wrote a letter to, actually kept several letters, but two of them have survived um, and are known as First and Second Corinthians. Um, he, he, uh, he writes this ode to love in the middle of a discussion on spiritual gifts. And it's very interesting and intriguing. Um, if we go to slide number three, and I don't think we did the opening video this morning, but maybe we can post that later uh, on our Facebook page, and you can see kind of the opening video of this particular installment of the story. Uh, but it's on page 427 in the storybook, if you have that with you, or you'd like to reference it later. And, and I mean, there's a, a, a decent... Uh, passage quoted right out of 1 Corinthians 13. I'm glad they really uh, helped uh, to present Paul's emphasis by, by including that particular paragraph from 1 Corinthians 13 because it really does set the tone for much of what Paul does. And so Paul calls a time out in the middle of this intense discussion on spiritual gifts and he says, you know guys, you can be very talented people. You can have a lot of giftedness. But if you fail to do what you do in love, man, it's really going to divide more than harmonize and unify. And it's going to do harm more than good. And so, you know, as I think about 1 Corinthians 13, and we're kind of in the summer season, and it's read at weddings a lot. And whenever we read 1 Corinthians 13, the responses of the hearers is usually something like, Oh, that's so good. Oh, that's neat. That's sweet. But I want you to know something. When we look at what Paul was dealing with in this little community, believer enclave in Corinth, that when they first got this from Paul, it wasn't a, ah, isn't that lovely, Paul? You, you darling. No, it's they're indicted. Because they're not loving. So Paul's praise of love indicts the church for its lack of love. And virtually every behavioral pattern in Corinth is mentioned in verses 4 through 7 of 1 Corinthians 13. Paul seems to say that the real problem was their lack of love. For love does not behave in the way that they are behaving. And so the entire letter stems from a refusal to love. And ironically, love is not a spiritual gift. It's a way that everybody travels. Love, all can display love that is able to transform what otherwise would be selfish, competitive, and divisive into something that builds up. And so... Again, to, to reiterate, the most lavish display of gifts and, and talents cannot compensate for lack of love. You know, I saw love a few weeks ago when we lost Brian Scheidler at his home. And I saw two Stones Hillers who were there that evening with Kelly. And, she, and they said, Kelly, you wait outside. Let us go in and tidy things up before you have to go back inside and face the trauma of what you've just been through. Uh, a couple of weeks ago after church, Kelly came up and she said, you know, someone paid a bill for me and I had no idea who had, they had done it. I went to pay it and it was already paid. That's love. Um, I saw Tim and Debbie Skimmerhorn and so many others help with sound and Barb and Linda Owen, uh, Barb Donnelly, Linda Owens, uh, and the wonderful food preparation team create a, I think, our first ever taco bar in honor of Brian. I, that was love. That's love. That's not so much the big, big things. It's those little things that we do. You know, I saw love the other day. I was running the flotilla road race in Syracuse. And a, I was running along trying to get my breath. And Joe Keene stopped traffic for me. Joe Keene usually sits right up here. I don't think he's here this morning. But he stopped traffic for me. And let me go by without getting ran over. And that's always a blessing. <laughs> and it's really kind of a pain to have to worry about that when you're barely surviving, sucking wind, trying to get oxygen to survive. But he took care of that. That's love. Um, when we went out of state uh, recently, uh, like I said, Joe and Janet and Jenna Hutzel, 
agreed to look after our grouchy dogs for a whole week. And, um, and we really appreciated that. That's always something you have to worry about when you go out of town. I, I saw love uh, when Sarah Weimer posted about the 139th picture of her smiling, handsome baby son. I think that's the most photographed baby in northeast Indiana. Love. I saw love, and I'm just taking a cross, a recent cross section, okay? I could do this any given week or month of life here in, in our area, but uh, I saw love when uh, Paul fought in the, uh, the uh, volunteer, the year of volunteerism, Operation Foundation 2016, organizing ourselves and our community for extreme acts of volunteerism. That's love. Some guy all tatted up, rough looking dude rolled down his window and I'm in the middle of all the poison ivy and the, all the other crap okay the ground is cursed the ground is cursed I just tell you that but I was in there you know I'm going to town with my weed eater and trying to get that stuff out of there and the rough looking guy didn't know me from Adam and he rolls down the window and says hey thanks for doing that you're well no problem glad to do it it's a gateway to our city from the north side. It's important. People have a good impression when they pull into our city. No problem. But all that's possible. Not just that, but so many of you are doing things for our community and have done things for our community. And it's all done. And when it's all done in the name of love, it's a beautiful thing. I had my neighbor drop by a black raspberry pie. As you know, I'm a sugar addict. I will never. Hi, my name is Joey. I am a believer in Jesus, and I struggle with sugar addiction. Thanks for letting me share. That's my story. Okay? I always have been. I always will be, I think, to the day I die. But uh, God is good. My neighbor dropped by a black raspberry pie. And I enjoyed it like four or five different times. I'll say it that way. Love. That's what love does. Dana Brown led an installment of the story in my absence. Uh, Tom Leach did before that. That's love. An act of love. I think these are the kinds of things that change the world. Love endures forever. It's superior to imperfect gifts every time. Uh, I think sometimes we look for the heroic deeds or acts. Sometimes we look for the person with the greatest prophetic utterance. Or maybe we look to someone with a sensational spiritual gift. And these kind of catch our attention sometimes. But I think that uh, when we look at Paul, what Paul says here, uh, instead of sensational display of spiritual utterance, how about just getting up and going to work every day and using all of your words to build up other people in a way that engenders faith in them? How about that? Or instead of wowing the crowd with all, all that the future will bring, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, maybe slide number 4, put that up, and I'm kind of referencing it now. Uh, the verse, first few verses. Instead of wowing the crowd with all that the future will bring. How about, and it's important that we understand prophecy, and we definitely will deal with that as we deal with books that deal with that in the Bible. But how about just giving someone a little bit of hope that their tomorrow will be brighter because you are in their life loving them? How about that? That their tomorrow will be better because you're in their life and you're going to love them. That's a beautiful thing. And instead of becoming a hero or a celebrity, how about just doing little acts with great love every day for as long as you have life? Maybe. Maybe. A living out a vision of a Harlan Heights. 
creating these moments of love and surprise that change a community. And see, when we look at life as a whole, we don't need sensational people. We need people who are radically committed to love regardless of what their gifts may be. And that's where the Corinthians went awry. They were all stoked about how talented they were. And Paul calls a time out and he says, Fellas, we've got to think differently about how we're doing this thing called life. And, he, and he, when we look at this, there, uh, Paul doesn't use adjectives to describe love, but he uses verbs, 15 of them in three verses. So love is a dynamic, it's an active thing, it's not something static. Uh, he is not talking about some inner feeling or emotion in this passage. He is talking about uh, describing a love that, ha- that is observable. Uh, the Corinthians were impatient. They were unkind. They were filled with jealousy. They were vainglorious and puffed up. They insisted on their own way. They were cantankerous. They were resentful. They, they rejoiced in wrong rather than right. And so Paul praises love as if love were a person. He doesn't say, now you Corinthians, be patient. You Corinthians, be kind. He doesn't confront them directly that way. Instead, he personifies love and he talks about love as if love were a person. And he says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. And so Paul is like giving us a behavioral definition of love. He tells us how love behaves in relationships with others. And what Paul writes about here would resolve all of the issues in Corinth in four short verses. And I dare say about 95% of your life issues, your marriage, your family issues, community issues, work issues, probably about 95% of them could be resolved in those four verses. And Paul personifies love. Again, he doesn't say, you must be patient, you must be kind. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. And so, when he personifies love, it's like he's describing a person that he has met. And so, it's Paul's way of saying that love is someone you meet before it's something that you do. Love is is someone you meet before it's something that you can do. And I think it's intriguing uh, because when we look at the book of 1 Corinthians as a whole, we understand that Paul starts out this very powerful letter to this little believer enclave in clustered up there in Corinth. And he writes in this 1 Corinthians letter in chapters 2 and 3, you're going to see him talk and reference about the cross of Christ many times in the early part of the letter. And so, in the very beginning, uh, we see these, these men and women and they're fighting and they're jealous and they're envious and, and they're not saying, oh, that's good, Paul. They're, they're, they're hearing this description, this ode to love, this personification of love. And it's, it's kind of beginning, it's Paul's way of getting into their hearts and having them to think about, you know what, maybe love is a person before it's something that we do. And maybe I'm forgetting that person. And Paul was like, in the beginning of this letter, he says, you know, you're forgetting the cross, guys. How can you be so proud if you remember the cross? How, how can you be so selfish if you remember the cross? He says, I want you to thank the cross. And who was it that hung on the cross? It humbles you. And, and who do you see as the ultimate example of this passage? In fact, if we went through this passage, you could substitute the word love. You could substitute that Jesus. And you would have a great description of the life of Jesus. And all that he went through. Because where do you see the ultimate example of, of love does not keep a record of wrong? Hanging on a cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Or uh, where do you see the ultimate example of love never giving up? Father, remove this cup from me. Never let, nevertheless, not my will, but mine be done. You see, the ultimate source of love is Christ. And before love 
is a behavior and a Christian. Love is an experience for the Christian. And love is something or someone you meet before you do it. And so Paul is saying for these guys, and it's an important part of the story, that there's one who lived a life of sacrificial love. And when we begin to live a life of sacrificial love, then good things begin to happen. Marriages can get healed and families can be saved and and communities can be restored to all that they were intended to be. At one point, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, adulterers, idol worshipers, homosexual prostitutes, the greedy, thieves, drunkards. Then he says, such were many of you, but you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Now imagine all of the relational problems that they had in this in this community of believers trying to heal after adulterous relationships, trying to get past experimental homosexual acts, trying to get past all of the drinking and the partying and the things that you didn't see coming in your life that you did because you engaged in that kind of a lifestyle. This was one messed up, chaotic community. And Paul says, you know what, guys? The only way we're ever going to fix it is you've got to meet a person. And until you meet a person and have that power working in your life, you're going to continue to have all the, the chaos and things that you've been having. And when we look at this in, in 1 Corinthians 8, and what's interesting is that the terminology he uses here in this passage, we've seen it in other places in the book of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 8, he calls them puffed up. And then he says here, love is not proud, verse 4. It does not boast. But they were puffed up in 1 Corinthians 8. And in chapter 10, he says they're self-seeking. And that's the word that he says here, love seeketh not her own. Uh, in chapter 7, he calls them rude. And so in a way, he's addressing the use of spiritual gifts in this 1 Corinthians 13 passage nested between 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. All right. He interrupts that flow, that presentation on spiritual gifts and says, by the way, love is a way we all can travel. Here's what would resolve not only the use of spiritual gifts in your body. Here's what would resolve 95% of the problems in the whole letter. Love is a person you meet before it's a behavior that you do. And love learns to look past the insults. Love is patient, he says. Patience is an inner power to bear injuries without meltdown. Love is kind. It's active. It's passive in that it's patient. We wait sometimes. It's active in that it's kind. It shows how we treat someone with kindness. Uh, Paul says it does not envy love or Jesus does not boast love Jesus is not proud Jesus does not dishonor others he is not self giving or self seeking he is not easily angered he keeps no record of wrongs Jesus does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And so love spills out of the one who has encountered the very person of love itself. Verse 7, Jesus always protects. Love always protects. You know, I'm going to believe the very best about a person. And I'm going to choose to treat them in high regard. Just because that's what love does. Love covers. It protects. It trusts. Jesus hopes. Jesus perseveres. Love covers. Love, love covers it over. Love stays put and believes the best. Love works at the family level. It works at the employment level. It works at the church level. The community level. It's a choice that we make. Love never fails. 
slide number five. The other sensational gifts Savior we engage in. The question is, have I met him? Have I met him? And do I need to reconnect with him? You know, uh, Paul knew that those who chose love had some very difficult decisions to make. And love's decision I have found, and this is more just experientially and pastorally that I would just share this with you, that love's decisions, there's three hard decisions that love has to make. And one of the first, they were in their debt to each other. They had offended each other. They had, they had um, well, they have lived the opposite of all that Paul presents here. And, uh, and one of the first decisions that they were going to have to, to, to make and that love was going to have to make is to cancel the debt that people owe you. And maybe there's a debt that someone owes you and they've really disappointed you in life and they've really made life really difficult for you. And I, you know, I know I'm, you know, Mr. Citizen of the Year and I'm the pastor and I'm this and I'm that. But so many times I've hurt my wife and I've hurt maybe my family or other special people in my life. And, um, and we do that sometimes. We create this kind of relational debt and it's because we are sinful people and we are selfish people and we, and we forget about who it is on the cross and how we're to live our life self-sacrificially as he lived his. And sometimes we can be harsh with people and we can be cold to people and we can insult people and we can inflict pain on somebody who hurts us and maybe pass judgment on others and, and maybe it makes us feel better after a while if we've if we're able to, to kind of get back and maybe try to even the score and balance out the debt that's owed. But what happens is it kind of melts us into its likeness over time. And if you make the other person pay the debt, you're changing. It is controlling you. And you become something you never wanted to become. And so love's decision this morning, the very first thing here is cancel the debt. That's what some of you need to do. Write paid in full. And have the picture of Jesus on the cross as your payment. Because it will control you. The unfairness of life will color everything about your life. And, um, and so I say to you this morning pastorally and just applicationally here that the first thing that needs to happen in some of your hearts and lives is to cancel the debt. It frees you up to love. It frees you up to love in the background. It frees you up to create these special moments where love can shine in the life of another. And secondly, and it's what the Corinthians needed to do, is to identify with the person in your life or the persons in your life that have created a debt in your life um, what happens is we can create monsters out of normal people and we can highlight something that they have done and we can dehumanize them because it lets us hate them more and this is a problem in our world you know I watched the um the political party speeches and not one of them stood up and said I want to read 1 Corinthians 13 today Trump didn't do it Hillary sure didn't do it not one because it's not about love now you can lead in love and there's a way to do that but our world isn't about love our world is about creating monsters that we can hate better and easier. And see, when you've been, when somebody's died on a cross for you and they've canceled a debt that you owe, it changes the way you look at life. And in fact, chances are 
all of us here this morning, the things that we hold, the debts that we hold over people, chances are you've done the same thing to someone else only in a little different way. You've robbed someone else of something in a little different way. Maybe not the same, but a little different way. I see what love does. Love cancels the debt. Love identifies with the person and gives their humanity back to them. And says, you know what? I'm just like you in a lot of ways. And then the the third hard decision that love has to make is let it go. You move on. You trust God to take care of things. And you pull your mind away from obsessing over it. And you don't give it any more of your energy. And if the other person... Uh, you know, the other, if the other person feels like they won something in the game, fine. But you've decided to not even play the game anymore. Because you, you're part of a different and a bigger and a better revolution. Canceling the debt. Identifying with the person. Let, restoring their humanity back to them. Letting things go. Does it remind you of somebody this morning? To love somebody, not for what they bring you, but just for who they are. To love somebody unconditionally. Love for somebody in spite of our sins. Love for somebody in spite of the cost. Do you know this incredible love? That when you see it, it just shatters you. It happened about 2,000 years ago. And Jesus came into the garden. Everything was thrown at him. And this is the only person who has ever had to love and literally endure everything. First of all, he, he comes to his disciples and he says, You know what, guys? I'm about to die for you. How about staying awake with me for a little while? And three times they fall asleep in his hour of greatest need. Will his love cover that? Will his love be able to cover that? Will his love be able to bear that? Secondly, the Father doesn't, uh, doesn't not permit him to forgo the cup. He has to drink it. Third, he's insulted while on the cross. Fourth, he's cut off from the Father's love for three hours prior to his death. He never stopped loving. And see, we have to meet love before you can do love. And before love becomes a behavior in you, it has to become a person to you. Love happened. Love was a person. And when love meets you like that, it changes your whole approach to God and to life, to self and to everyone else. And so this morning, love is a person you meet before it's something you can do. And if you're not loving well, maybe you're not seeing Jesus as well as you should. Because he's a beautiful thing. I want us just to close with a prayer here this morning. And um, thank you for being here. And thank you for walking with us through this many installments of the story. 29, 30, and 31. We got three to go. So uh, to keep tracking with it. Three more weeks, we'll, be, we'll, we'll wrap it up. But um, I was thinking maybe if we have some college students with us today, that maybe we would have some of them to come forward and we would pray for them as they get ready to launch out and uh, share our love with them in this way. So. If you're a college student, you're going to be going back to college in the month of August or September. Maybe you could come up this morning. Just come on up in the front. I'm kind of putting you on the spot, I know. Uh, But let's just have you come up. That'd be awesome. We love you. And we're cheering for you. And I'm going to, I'm just even going to put you on the spot a little bit more. Um, You guys just face the front, okay? Just yeah, just you, you're so handsome and beautiful. I want them to see you. So face the front. Do you guys have anything you would add to this little homily on love? Anything? Wisdom from the from the youth and college age. Anybody? Would you like to dress love? Uh, the thought of love. Anybody? Okay. All right. I guess not. Okay. I bet you yeah go ahead okay good well you guys are love agents in the world and uh, we're going to just commission you as agents of love we need a revolution of love 
And uh, we want you to stand for the truth, but we want you to love people in the process. And so we're just going to pray that God will bless you in that way and uh, help all of us love more. It's important to love and be loved. Our world's thirsty for love. People need it. And um, we blossom when we're loved unconditionally. And like I said, there's so many times in my life, I got these, all these memories right now going through my head of the times that I didn't love. And boy, it just sticks with you. But uh, So I come with kind of repentant spirit here this morning, but also with a joyous spirit that I've got Him in my life, Christ in my life, and He can help me love. He can help you love. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for your love and your grace. And thank you for these college kids here. And we know they're going to be launching here in a few weeks. And the great launch will begin momentarily. And then in waves, one by one, they'll disappear. And they'll take off again. Back to their dorm rooms or maybe to the college campus for the first time. And we just pray that you would watch over them and strengthen them. And you would help them to feel the love of the church family today. Uh, that from an early age we dedicate them, as we've done this morning. And then we launch them, and we cheer for them, and we uphold them in our prayer. And so today, we commission them to be radical love agents in the world. And uh, you bless them with insight into how they can work in the world, even working behind the scenes in the world to create these moments of encounter for people and most importantly that others would encounter the person of love before they ever attempt to do love and I just pray this morning that those here who have been touched by hate and unloving ways that they would be able to do the radical acts of love that they would cancel the debt restore humanity and let it go. And this would be their act of worship here this morning. In your name, amen. Thanks, guys.